So maybe just to start, um, and I promise this will get to a, to a punchline, but uh, show of hands, how many people had a Sony Walkman at some point in their life? Okay. And then how many people have a Spotify account today? Okay. So th these are examples of two different types of market structures, okay? So your Sony Walkman was built up around uh, a concept called hardware interoperability, okay? So the people who made the Sony Walkman, they could be reasonably confident that they could go invest the R&D dollars, sell you the Sony Walkman, because there was a standard that was gonna uh, mean that cassettes, right? Dance Mix 96, uh, George Michael, Bon Jovi, whatever you're into, uh, you could buy those cassettes, you could put them in your Sony Walkman and you could listen to music, right? The thing that underpins a market based on hardware interoperability is lots of manufacturing, uh, distribution, logistics, right? Someone had to buy the plastic, buy the magnetic reel tape, silk screen it, you know, produce it somewhere, ship it to the store, you had to go drive and get it, pick it up, buy it, now you're listening to music. Uh, fast forward to today, we all have Spotify accounts. Spotify is a market that's built up around interoperable software standards, okay? so different underlining properties of the market based on interoperable software standards. There is no distribution cost, right? The, zero, the, the, the distribution cost of content effectively goes to zero. You can click a button and you can get 100 million people uh, the same song as opposed to think of the, lo the manufacturing logistics that was involved in getting the, the same 100 million uh, people the, the, a song in the, in the Sony Walkman days. Um, and counterintuitively, you'd think if the cost of distribution goes down to zero, right, you'd think the, the market would shrink. But counterintuitively, you can now get the same content out to way more people uh, for lower cost, and that market actually grows, right? We've all been sitting out, you know, uh, with, with friends reminiscing about that song from the 90s. Someone br brings it up on Spotify. In a, in a market based on interoperable hardware, you never would just be like, hold on, I'm going to go drive to the store. I'll be back in three hours so we can listen to it. Um, so we think a lot about, um, at my vision, we think a lot about how does that transformation that's happened in, it happened to Block, Blockbuster with Netflix, happened, you know, Sony Walkman to Spotify, how does that transformation ultimately apply to our market? And one of the things that we think a lot about is something we call the refresh rate problem. Um, so if you think about the cost of an intersection, when you put it in, uh, you have capital cost up front, you have an ongoing operating cost that you have to spend over its useful life, and today there's no income stream against, against the intersection. And so depending on the intersection, where it is, how big it is, you, know, you could have a total cost of ownership of that intersection over its useful life you know, in the half million and up range. Um, intersections are very expensive, therefore the, the refresh rate on them is long, right? We keep an intersection out there for 20, 25 years when we put it in because the unit economics sort of dictate that that's what we have to do. So the, the, the challenge that that creates is if, 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 this, if this room was to you know, fix traffic tomorrow, we were in to invent some new way to fix traffic tomorrow, it would take the rest of most of our careers to deploy it at scale, and by the time we were done, it would be five generations of technology behind because in lots of industrial technology contexts, the refresh rates are more in the three to five year range. In our industry, they're in the 20 to 25 year range, right? So we have this, this refresh rate problem um, and we can look to, you know, we, we think we talk a lot about smart cities. Smart cities for some reason have, have not gone to scale, but we can look at LED streetlights as an example of where it did. And it was fundamentally because the unit economics changed, right? When LED streetlights were expensive relative to the energy cost savings, you saw, you know, virtue-based buying, small pilots, right, demonstration technology showcases, uh, but you didn't see it go to scale. It was only when the capital cost got small enough relative to the energy cost savings where you saw it take off, right, because we solved the fundamental unit economics problem. So um, I don't have time in the nine minutes I have up here to get into all of the, the details on, on how we're thinking about this, but if you think about an intersection today, it's, a, it's an analog traffic cabinet uh, built in an in a, in a interoperable hardware standards-based way, right? So uh, the analogy I'll, I'll often use is if you think about before you had a smartphone, you would buy a Motorola flip phone, you'd buy a Garmin GPS unit, you'd buy a portable DVD player, a calculator, and a flashlight, right? And depending on what you wanted to do, you'd grab the right piece of hardware for the job. Today, all those things can be done by your smartphone. Common hardware, 
and the overall cost of the hardware part of the system has gone way down. Um, and so, so we're doing a lot of thinking about how do we move off of analog electrical cabinet standards, consolidate towards digital, how do we move off proprietary sort of uh, single instance, you know, single tenant software uh, towards reusable software, which again can drive more automation, drive down costs. And then also thinking a lot about how do you make an intersection more like a transit bus where it can generate income from the data and the services that, that are there. So I'll talk a little bit um, in the time I have left here, I'll talk a little bit about some emerging trends that sort of give you some, maybe give you some, uh, some thinking uh, that can inform all the roundtables today. Um, so the first one I'll talk about is, is 5G and specifically something called a mech in the 5G architecture. Um, today, you know, if you remember when you had your 3G phone, you know, you'd be out in your backyard trying to find the signal. Now 4G, wire, high speed wireless is ubiqu ubiquitous, right? You can basically get it anywhere you are. Uh, one of the things that 5G promises is to do the same thing that uh, high speed access to the internet did with 4G, to do that with compute, right? So the mech will put compute in the mesh uh, that you'll be able to access on demand. That'll drive down the cost of your device, right? Now your phone or your intersection, your car can access essentially infinite compute uh, at super low latencies, right? This will, this will drive uh, a transformation in the capital cost of infrastructure over the next five or 10 years. Um, you know, how many people have tried ChatGPT? If you haven't, give it a shot, it's spooky. Um, the, the rate that AI is coming on, I've been in the technology business for 20 years, uh, it, I've never seen anything coming online so fast as AI. I think there's all sorts of applications to things like, like how we do signal retimings uh, in, in our industry. And then the really interesting one is that the automotive manufacturers are, are sort of getting through their transformation, trying to turn cars into computers on wheels. And they're starting to look around for, hey, I wanna connect to this data, this infrastructure data that's coming off intersections, realizing that's hard to do. Uh, there's a few, few examples, but, but none scaled. Uh, the, the opportunity there is to create income streams for cities, right? All of a sudden, there's safety applications or just sort of like the general you know, dop dopamine hit that we like as consumers, uh, we're willing to pay for that. Uh, I think there's a funding source for an intersection. And, and then lastly, um, there's, there's a emerging trend in something called the voluntary carbon offset markets. So traditionally carbon offset markets have been regulated. Uh, more and more now there's voluntary markets, um, things like the SEC rule ch proposed rule change that would say that US public companies now have to report their, uh, their, their carbon performance the same way they do their financial performance is driving demand for uh, basically buying offsets in, in carbon. And if you think about what a lot of companies in this room do, we, we, we have some role to play in optimizing traffic networks. That is a direct um, correlation to the reduction of emissions. And we believe that there's another income stream for cities uh, where they can start to monetize those, those emission reductions. So, so all, all, all in all um, is really to say that I think our industry has a unit economics problem. I think it's born in the standards that we've been using since the 80s. Uh, I think the opportunity is once in a generation opportunity to th rethink the, the, the capital cost around digitization and rethink about, rethink uh, software and income leveraging modern, modern ideas about how to leverage data. You know, we, at, my, at my vision, we say a lot that change will, ap either, change is inevitable. Change is either gonna happen to us or through us. And I think it's super inspiring that there's this many people in this room uh, here to, to think about uh, standards and uh, in innovation and gives me hope that, that they, we may be the catalyst of the change as opposed to the recipient of it. So thank you very much and looking forward to some of the roundtables.